Tonight's guest is Jill. Jill, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your time. Jill, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I am 40 years old, currently living in upstate New York. I am originally from Michigan, born and raised, lived the first 30 years or so of my life there, central Michigan to be exact. I have three daughters. I am an artist, do some graphic design, have six ferrets, and that's about it for me. Wow, what a great life you've carved out for yourself. I'm certainly satisfied. You should be. Sounds like you've got a great life going there. Yeah, you're a testament to the fact that even people with great lives have dogman encounters. So, it can happen to anyone. Jill, you've already had a dogman encounter, but what are your thoughts on having one with a Bigfoot? At this point, nothing would surprise me. I know that Dogman exists. Dogman was five feet away from me. We made eye contact. I was perfectly sober. I know that Dogman exists. So I would not be at all surprised to find a Bigfoot somewhere hanging out just like a Dogman. I mean, I'm sure it would be terrifying because you just never expect to see something so massive. But I would be like, yes, of course there's a Bigfoot. Would you almost welcome an encounter with a Bigfoot? In a way, yes. After you and I had our conversation about the dog man, it really made sense to me and alleviated a lot of fear that I had surrounding the situation. So I think that logically looking at the two, dog man is probably the more terrifying. I mean, he certainly seems in descriptions to have more horrifying features. You know, I don't even know if I'd mind seeing another dogman at this point. I think that I've become more curious than afraid. That's great to hear you say that because if you feel that way, then you're definitely in a good place with regards to your encounter. That's great. Yeah, you know, in the back of my mind, I had always known that had he wanted to hurt me, he would have hurt me. But after you and I spoke, And I realized that you've spoken to thousands and thousands of people, most of whom made it through completely unscathed. I realized what I already, you know, that he's not looking to hurt anyone, really. You know, I mean, I'm sure there are outliers. I wouldn't want to be unprotected near one. (laughs) I would prefer there to be at least a window between us. More than anything at this point, I'm just curious. What are they? Are they terrestrial? Are they not terrestrial? What are they doing? Do they have a purpose? How do they and Bigfoot, for that matter, manage to stay as secret, I guess, as they've stayed? I guess at this point, I'm just curious more than anything. Well, I don't need to tell you. It's great to hear that you've dealt with this in such a healthy way. That's wonderful. Well, you've certainly helped me. That's for sure. Well, that's music to my ears. That's what I'm here for. So, yeah, that's really good news. You seeing that dog man with your own eyes caused you to come to a realization that bothers you even more than seeing that dog man did. Please expand on that for us. Yes. Seeing the dog man made me realize that if the dog man is real, at the time in my mind I called him a werewolf because I had not yet heard of dog man. So if a werewolf is real is what I figured at the time. What else is real? You hear stories of cryptids that do hurt people of things of like crawlers and not deer and I mean, just to name a few. I mean, there's tons and tons of stories out there, some of which I'm sure are completely fake and some of which I'm sure are as real as mine. I know that growing up in that area of Michigan, I had always felt very afraid and people laughed and teased me about it. That's just Jill. She's afraid of everything. And it was true. Even as I grew up, I figured I'm going to get to a point where I don't have to sleep with the light on, where I don't have to have a television going all the time, where I can be alone and be comfortable. But it really just never happened for me. My entire life, I just had this creeping sense of fear. So when I saw the dog man, it just kind of, at that time, hammered home, like, you have a reason to feel afraid. These things exist. What else is out there? And I do still fear what else could be out there. I mean, you're not going to see me camping 
that's not for fear of dog man. It's for fear of, you know, missing 411. What's taking people? I don't think it's dog man. Maybe it is. Who knows? <laughs> but what else is real? I guess once you see one, you really can't look at anything else and go, well, that can't be real. I mean, I saw an eight foot tall dog man. What else is out there? Just imagine seeing something that's twice as terrifying to look at as a dog man. That wouldn't be good. I was paralyzed with the dog man for several seconds. It took him kind of making a gesture to make me snap out of it and take off. I probably just die of a heart attack, to be completely honest with you. Thankfully, since I have relocated to upstate New York here, the fear has gone like magic. And I don't know why that is, but there's just some primal part of me that's like, oh, it's not dangerous here. I hear dogman reports all the time from the area. I hear Bigfoot reports. And, you know, that doesn't really frighten me. And I've also kind of heard some things outside my window that I go, oh, goodness, what is that? And while you still wouldn't catch me camping or really even just strolling out into the middle of nowhere here, at least the fear is gone. At least I can, you know, lay down at night, turn off my light, go to sleep and be okay. Yeah, as long as you can say that, then you're definitely in a good place. And you just mentioned hearing something out the window, which brings us to the next topic. From what I understand, this past Halloween, you had a really frightening experience. Please talk us through that. Yeah, it was very strange. I had pulled an all-liner working on one of the kids' costumes because Halloween is my favorite holiday. And I've kind of passed it along, so we always have a big to-do every year. I had been working on one of the children's costumes. It was about 6.30 in the morning, maybe maybe a little earlier. And I hear this woman screaming bloody murder. I mean, screaming, help me, help me. Like there's the devil himself on her heels. So I run to my window thinking I'm going to see a woman being chased by something and there's nothing there. And as I get to my window, the woman screaming, help, her voice changes into this deep, guttural, roaring sound. Oh, man. It chills me thinking about it. Right now, just relaying that to you, I have goosebumps from head to toe. I have no idea what could have made that sound. My whole neighborhood still seemed to be asleep. For me, it was so loud. I was amazed. I expected to see people on their porch, you know, looking all over, trying to figure out what was going on. But I had been working in front of an open window, so it was probably louder for me than people who were in bed asleep. I have no idea what it was. I haven't heard anything like it since, thankfully. We do get kind of some strange noises around here. I chalk the vast majority of of it up to coyotes because they can sound really hellish in a pack. And that's a sound that I'm fairly familiar with from Michigan. So my daughters will come and they'll be like, oh my goodness, what's that? And they'll be like, oh, coyotes. <laughs> Go back to bed, hoping that I'm right, that it's coyotes. But I've never heard anything sound like a woman in distress. I mean, major distress like that. And her voice just morphed into a sound that no human could have made. I have no idea what that was. And things like that are what scares me. Yeah, that's awfully creepy. Really creepy. Could you tell if that was seemingly done for your benefit or just for anyone who could hear it? I have no idea. I thought it was odd, like I said, that it didn't wake the whole neighborhood up. As her voice changed into that roar, the end of that roar kind of sounded like a laugh. I thought for sure at first that it was a, you know how sometimes people have those recordings that'll play in their yards at Halloween. I went outside after an hour or so <laughs> because I was frightened to go around my neighborhood to see if anybody had any decorations that could make sounds or if anyone was playing any sort of like Halloween soundtracks or anything. And, you know, everyone was still largely asleep. I think it might have been either earlier than I'm recalling or perhaps a weekend because I remember that. The neighborhood was still quite sleepy. I didn't see anything that could have done it. So I honestly don't know. 
I don't know if it knew whatever it was that made that noise, knew, had saw me maybe in front of the window and knew that, you know, it would terrify me. Or if it honestly felt like it was trying to lure someone. I don't know whether it was trying to lure me specifically or whether it was just trying to see if it could get someone to go out there. I have no idea. And I don't know that I want to know. Yeah, I'd say. Whatever that was, I sure hope it doesn't come back. As do I. Yeah, I can understand why you would. All right, Jill, please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. My encounter happened in early September of 2005. I was 23 years old at the time, working as a waitress in a restaurant bar attached to a golf course. Normally, my shift ended around 9 p.m. The golfers would come in, they'd have their dinner, they'd talk to their friends, and then they'd go home. But this evening, the golf course had happened to be hosting a banquet. So we ended up having to stay a few hours late. Normally, I would have been driving home around 9 p.m., but at this point, it's probably 11 o'clock or so when I left the restaurant. It was a beautiful night. You know, there was no clouds. The stars were bright out in the middle of Michigan. That's something that I miss to this day because even here, you know, we don't live in the city, but there's so much light pollution. So I would oftentimes, even, you know, if I was ever driving when it was full dark outside, I would take my time. I'd roll my window down and I would, you know, look at the stars as I drove, kind of go a little slower than I needed to, listen to music. I had a three-year-old daughter at the time, so I think I used it for a little me time, maybe. This particular day, I'm driving home, and you can see for a good long while, the majority of the area that I would drive through, I would call them back roads. I wouldn't say they were way out in the country, but, you know, it was fields. Michigan's very flat, or at least the middle of Michigan is where I'm from. Very flat. So you can see the one lone house, you know, way out in the middle, and then you drive and there's more fields. And it was a lovely evening. As I'm approaching the road that I live on, and I'm getting ready to make the turn, uh, I notice that the trailer home that was, oh, I don't know, a few hundred yards maybe from the corner, they had a yard light out at the end of their driveway, and they had a fair amount of garbage there. Looked like maybe they'd done some spring cleaning or something. I mean, it was larger than your normal amount. I see what I believe is a bear. And I'm actually really excited. In Michigan, it's almost a sport, wildlife spotting. You know, everybody tells everybody, oh, I saw an eagle. Oh, I saw a wolf. And I had heard people say that there were bear in the area. But I myself had never seen one. So I got like immediately excited. You know, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my at the time husband that I saw a bear, I turn and I kind of pull up slowly because I'm hoping not to spook him. I'm hoping that he'll stay there long enough for me to get, you know, at least a look and confirm what I'm seeing. But as I'm approaching what I believe to be a bear, I start to realize that it just doesn't look right. I pull up next to it. I put my car in park and I'm looking out my passenger window and I can see the fur, and the fur is far too short to be a bear. I don't know a whole lot about bear, but this is fur that's like what a horse has or a Doberman. It's very short, and I can tell that whatever it is is very, very muscular. I can see its muscles, you know, moving as it's digging in this trash. But I also realize that what I think is the long side of a bear makes no sense. The muscles aren't moving correctly. There's a strange kind of hump where the back should be, you know? And I'm like, what am I looking at? And I'm expecting it to click. I'm not at all afraid, which is kind of funny, you know? I've heard a lot of people who mention having this kind of dread feeling before they even know the dog man is anywhere around. I had nothing like that. I was completely clueless. I pulled up and I'm watching it. And I'm realizing the shapes are just all wrong. And I'm thinking any second it's going to click. Any second it's going to click. I can't even figure out, you know, what end of it I'm looking at because it just makes no sense. I know that whatever it is, is hugely muscular. Like the muscles are so pronounced. 
it's almost like what you see on a bodybuilder, you know, how the skin is quite thin on them and you can generally, you know, see every well-defined muscle. It was very similar to that. And I'm thinking, what animal is built like this? And then he looked at me and I realized that what I thought was the broad side of a bear was actually his shoulders face on and he had his head down doing whatever it was that he was doing with the garbage. I wasn't looking at the broad side of a bear at all. He looked at me and I froze. Still, there's this little voice in the back of my head going, okay, it's going to click. What is it? It's going to click. You're going to figure out what it is. But I mean, he was massively muscular. His shoulders were the width of a black bear. I've never seen anything so muscular. And I'm not an expert on black bear. I mean, obviously, this could be not the most accurate of comparisons, but that's what I assumed I was approaching. I didn't get a sense that he had much of a neck. It was almost kind of like his shoulders just kind of humped and rolled up into his head. The fur was very dark, very short, covered the entire body. I didn't see much variation in length. He had the strangest eyes. His eyes glowed of their own light, which I've never seen anything like it in my life. Afterwards, I kept thinking to myself, it's got to be eye shine. It had to have been eye shine, but the yard light was directly above his head. And my headlights were well ahead of where he was because I had pulled up even and they, you know, they were pointing down the road. So I couldn't figure out what could have been causing any eye shine. Plus, it was like they had a light that was as intense as like an electric burner when it's fully heated up. They glowed with this reddish sort of amber color. He had a muzzle, but it was a very short muzzle more like a hyena or, you know, one of those shorter nosed dogs than a wolf or, you know, a German shepherd. I oftentimes hear people say German shepherd, like he looked nothing like a German shepherd. The mouth was the most horrible part. I had a hard time taking in the rest of him because of this mouth. The mouth looked kind of like an anglerfish's mouth. You know how they have those teeth that kind of interlock and the teeth are visible even when the mouth is closed. That's how his were. But he didn't have, you know, the very thin kind of needle-like teeth that they have. He had very thick, large teeth. And I swear, and this is the part that I've never heard anyone else say, and it always makes me think that maybe I am a crazy person. They almost looked metal. These teeth shone so brightly that it was almost like a metal type reflection. That's why I kept staring, thinking it's an animal, with a can or something in his mouth, and it's going to click for me and I'm going to realize what it is. But they were his teeth. I assume they weren't metal and they just happened to shine strangely for whatever reason. I mean, his eyes glowed, so it's not so far-fetched to think, well, his teeth are strange too. But I'm just staring at him and he's staring at me and we've locked eyes I'm just sitting there doing nothing and he starts to stand and I realize that he stands bipedally that he stands like a man and he's slowly standing his eyes locked on mine and I managed to reach over and take my car out of park but I'm still just kind of almost in a daze staring at this thing and then he opened that mouth which I kept staring at thinking, okay, there's something in the mouth that can't be the mouth, that can't be the mouth. But no, that was the mouth. He slowly started to open that mouth and I finally unfroze. And that's when I just slammed my foot onto the gas. And of course my car starts to fishtail. I have this horrific moment where all I can think of is it's going to be me alone in the ditch with the werewolf. My brain is screaming werewolf because oddly enough, living in the center of Michigan, where Dogman is oftentimes said to have originated, I had never heard of the Dogman. It seems like people in that area are very, very good at blowing things off. They're very good at going, 
oh, you know, that wasn't that. Oh, you're mistaken. So I had managed to make it, you know, 23 years without ever even hearing of the dog man. So I drove way too fast, the two miles or so to my home, which is not a comforting distance from dog man. I drove right up to my door. I scrambled over my passenger seat, went into my house, proceeded to go around and lock every door and window while my ex-husband is following me around. And all I'm saying is there's a werewolf and he's laughing and he's going, there's not a werewolf. What are you talking about? And I'm telling him, I'm going, no, there's a werewolf. And I'm trying to tell him what I had seen. And he's just not having any of it. He's telling me that a neighbor's Rottweiler had gotten out or I saw a deer from a strange angle. And I'm going, that's not possible. Like You don't understand. He's going, it was a big dog. And I'm going, he stood up on two legs. He kind of makes a sound and goes back to his video game. That night, I don't know that I slept a wink. I was hypervigilant. I remained hypervigilant for a lot of years. In all fairness, I had been fairly hypervigilant before. Like I said, I'd always been afraid. For a long time, I didn't tell really anyone else because I knew what I would get having grown up where I grew up. Several years after it happened, I can't even remember what we were talking about, but my grandmother brought up someone saying they had seen something. And I said, well, you know, I saw a werewolf once. And she goes, oh, you did not. You know, and I tell her the story. My grandmother, God rest her, was a wonderful woman, but she certainly wasn't hearing about werewolves. <laughs> so I don't think she believed the word I said. I kept it to myself for a very long time. I think the next time I actually even mentioned it to anyone was after I had met my current husband and then already moved out here to New York. And that was the first person I think that didn't laugh at me. He actually, you know, mentioned like, you know, have you looked for it? And I hadn't, you know, it just for some reason, it was one of those things that I had kept so buried that it just didn't even occur to me that I could search for this on Google. And this was several years ago. This was probably back in 2011, 2012. And I did some searching and I heard a lot of accounts, but. I didn't hear anything that sounded kind of like what I had seen. A lot of people were like, oh, no, that wasn't that wasn't a dog, man. You know, you probably saw this or that or but I know that whatever I saw was definitely of a canine type. The mouth obviously was horrific and something else, something else to look at anyways. But he was absolutely of like the canine persuasion. He had a muzzle. He had the ears that stood up, the ears articulated. I tried to convince myself for a long time that it was a man in a suit. I couldn't quite get past the muscles moving under the skin, you know, and how the ears and the mouth and everything, you know, how everything was so. If this would have been a costume, this person had to have worked for a multi million dollar studio. If this was a costume, it was the best costume I have ever seen in my life. So yeah, I did some research, but like I said, I didn't really find anything that kind of matched up. And I kind of just went back to keeping it to myself for a while. I told my kids as they got older, because they loved to hear the story of the time mom saw the dog man. So <laughs> I kind of managed to repeat it. I think they felt safe being that, you know, they lived in New York and this happened several states away when they were well, one of them was very little, two weren't born yet. And it wasn't until recently, one night when I was bored and just kind of flipping through the internet that I happened upon Reddit. And I know that sounds ridiculous. I mean, I'm 40 years old. I spend most of my time online and I had somehow never managed to make it to Reddit, but I hadn't. And they had a dogman forum. That is how I, I finally ended up writing my encounter down, expecting people to be like, oh, that's not a dog, man. You know, you saw whatever it is they may have thought that I saw. But most people were like, no, they come in several different types, you know, and they and they were quite accepting. And, you know, it turns out that a lot of people had had a similar experience. And I felt kind of, I mean, there were some people obviously that were trying to tell me it was a skinwalker or I had seen an actual, you know, werewolf, people wanting to know if his chest was bald or no, his chest wasn't bald. Like he had short black fur. 
all over. And even if his chest had been bold, I still can't see how that would make him anything but a dog man. And then I had been listening to your podcast for a while, and I finally got the courage to send you my story. And here we are. Well, I'm glad you did. Yeah, obviously glad you did reach out. So that's a good thing. It's obvious that you're really impressed by his physical presence, Jill, but how do you think he'd fear in a fight against a grizzly? Oh, he would mow right through a grizzly like nothing. I have never seen anything so large in my entire life. And I was out of there before he was even made it fully out of a crouch to a standing position. Like he wasn't all the way standing and he was towering over my car. Like I said, when I first saw him, I thought he was a bear. And I say him, I'm assuming it was a him. You know, he didn't have any female equipment. I don't know how dog men work. I guess, you know, he could have been a lady. I got the impression that it was a him, so I say him. I mean, from the side with his just his shoulders, you know, with his head bent down, digging through the garbage, I thought he was a bear. I mean, he was, goodness, maybe five six feet across i mean no maybe maybe five feet across i'm sorry i'm really not good with measurements but me looking at him straight on the only thing that made sense was bear he was an appropriate size just in shoulder width to be a bear the muscles i've never seen anything like it i have never seen anything so large so imposing and terrifying i mean that face was horrifying to be completely honest my blood ran cold when I saw that face. It was a face only a mother could love. I mean, he was hideously terrifying. But I would feel very, very sad for any grizzly who happened across his path on a bad day. Yeah, I can understand why you would say that. Most eyewitnesses say that when I ask that question. What can you tell us about his claws? Unfortunately, I didn't get much of a look at them. He never brought them up or anything. He must have been crouched down real low because he was massive. I don't know even how he fit all of him behind that pile of garbage or the vast majority of him behind that pile of garbage. His neck, as I said, was kind of rounded up into the head. So I'm trying to think all I could see as he stood. He slowly lifted that head and then he started to stand. I made it about visually down to the forearms maybe or the elbows his arms were just massive his chest was just massive and then my eyes just kept going back to the teeth the teeth the teeth the eyes the teeth the eyes i wish i could go back and (laughs) tell myself wait he's trying to scare you just wait a little longer see what those claws are like see what those legs are like i would really love to know if You know, he had legs like a man or legs like a dog, but nope, I just, my fear got the better of me and I floored it. I'm glad you did. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't see any more than you did that night. Thank goodness for that. If you've had a dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. You said his teeth were shining so much they almost looked to you like they were metal. What color were they, though? They had what seemed to be a silverish cast to them. Now, I've thought about this over and over and over and over, and I always hesitate to try, like when I tell people this story, I'm like, should I actually tell them that? But I finally decided, you know, it is what it is. It's what I saw. It does nobody any good if I leave it out. I'm assuming they weren't metal, but you know how like regular teeth, they're just, you know, they're kind of a dull white. It happens to be dark and someone happens to have excellent dental care. You know, you might be able to see them exceptionally well, but it was more than that. It was almost like white teeth that had like a metallic sheen to them. I mean, maybe it was just the strength of them. I mean, we don't know what they're made of, unfortunately. (laughs) We've never, or at least if we have ever gotten a corpse, no one's ever came forward. I'm assuming he's terrestrial. You know, he was going through garbage, but those teeth, they had a shine to them that I had 
never seen before and I have never seen since. You know, they weren't like chrome, like a bumper or anything, but they weren't normal teeth either. Like there was something much different about them. They were huge, obviously. They were very impressive. And I have never seen teeth. They had to have been reflecting the light around them in a weird way. I, you know, I've never seen anything like it since now that I think about it. I hope you never see teeth like that again. Same. Got my fingers crossed on that. Not to lead you, but do you see any possibility that its teeth could have been so white they looked metallic? Oh, it's absolutely possible. I know that I have never seen teeth that resembled it. That's for sure. When I try to bring up, oh, is it like a color like this metal or that metal? None of that fits either. They were definitely teeth. They just had this almost metallic shine to them that made them look really strange. I mean, it's entirely possible that they were just so bright and so strangely clean that my mind couldn't fathom that here we have this massive, hulking, rugged looking beast with porcelain white teeth. It's entirely possible. I mean, they definitely were more white than anything else. But I remember just in the moment, you know, I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, is that metal? Does he have metal in his mouth? What am I seeing? Why is that so bright? But no, he certainly articulated them. Like there wasn't, there wasn't anything in there. I wasn't seeing them weirdly. I mean, I was seeing them weirdly. (laughs) I still, you know, really can't tell you exactly what color they were. They just had this shine. I mean, they were as prominent as his eyes and his eyes were glowing. Well, I can understand why you're reluctant to tell us about that quality his teeth had, but all we want here is the truth. As long as it's the truth and that's all we care about. Well, that it definitely is. No, I believe you. I believe you. Was he drooling when he opened up his mouth? No. And that I have always found rather strange because I kept thinking to myself, I don't know how he would even live or eat or go around you know with teeth like that i mean they were so prominent that his lips didn't seem to cover them and you would think since his lips didn't seem to cover them there would be drool happening but if there was you know it was it wasn't anything that was noticeable to me in the moment you know he wasn't slobbering or anything he just kind of parted those lips you know away from them further kind of like a snarl and then opened that mouth, you know, nice and slow. And I'm just sitting there in shock, watching this mouth get wider and wider and wider. I just, my brain couldn't take it. I had to get out of there. But no, there was no prominent saliva or anything happening. Well, I'm glad for that. Yeah, that would have made it that much more traumatic. Agreed. How was he holding his ears when he opened up his mouth? Originally, his ears were in an upright position. They were kind of shaped like a horse's or a dog's, maybe something in between. I would say they were a little too long to be a dog's, but they were fairly prominent. They weren't his most prominent feature by any stretch. And he was just holding them normal, like, you know, forward. Then, you know, he started to open that mouth. And as he opened that mouth, the ears kind of laid back like you see when like a horse or something is angry at you, <laughs> you know, they've had it up to there. To me, I recognized it as an aggressive sort of stance. You know, you see those ears go down on an animal and you're like, oh, it's mad at me. That's how I reacted just kind of physiologically like, oh, here's this massive animal that's mad at me. You poor thing. No one should have to see that. He was black, but how would you describe the condition of his coat? Beautiful. He was pristine. He looked so rugged and he looked so massive and powerful. I mean, he would be a dentist's dream. He was pristine. His fur, I didn't see any ticks or anything. You know, and I stared at what was his shoulders and kind of the back of his neck for, you know, several seconds, really taking it all in. It was beautiful. His fur was like that of a well groomed dog or well-groomed horses you know it was all uniform that i could see it was you know jet black the skin that i could see 
underneath seemed to be clean and in like good condition. Like, and that was something that was kind of stumping me too. I kept thinking, well, what am I looking at? Whatever it is, it's, you know, well taken care of. Because normally when you get close enough to see that kind of detail on an animal that spends a lot of time in the woods, you'll see ticks and you'll see burrs and you'll see, you know, imperfections that say to you, oh, this animal spends a lot of time outdoors, a lot of time in the woods. But he was spotless from what I could tell. That all fits. Yeah, a lot of eyewitnesses describe the dogman they saw as looking that way. I hate to ask you this, but has anyone questioned your sanity when you told them about your encounter? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that originally, you know, when I told my ex-husband, you know, he just he just thought I was crazy. He thought that I had seen a dog, or I'd seen the flash of a deer at the wrong angle and made this whole story up. I had gotten angry at him for refusing to hear what I was saying. And he said to me, well, maybe you don't know you're wrong. Maybe that's what your brain thought you saw. Like, it wasn't a flash. You know, I sat there and I stared at him. I know that where I'm from, that's why you don't say things like that. You know, your family's going to be like, well, you know, they're crazy, but we won't tell anyone because you're family. Anyone else is liable to make a call about you. You just don't talk about that sort of stuff where I'm from unless you are very, very secure in the knowledge that whoever it is that you're speaking with will still accept you even if they think you're nuts. Sure is a shame you have to worry about that, but I understand why you do. Not believing you is one thing, but actually questioning your sanity, that's a totally different matter. Yeah, and you look at someone, I mean, this was my husband at the time. He'd known me, we'd been together for five, six years at that point. We had a daughter. He knew I wasn't one to spin fanciful stories. I had never seen anything like that you know, before. I mean, everyone laughed at me for being afraid, but that was just, oh, that's Jill. She's afraid of the dark. You know, she's afraid of being alone. And I was, but you look at somebody and, you know, it's really hard to forgive someone after we've lived through all of this together. And you can't even think that maybe I'm telling you the truth on this, that, I mean, you know, maybe we've been through things and no, it's very hurtful. Yeah, shame on him for responding that way. For what it's worth, I definitely believe you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Did the way your ex-husband responded to you telling him about your encounter strain the relationship you had with him? It sounds like it did. Yeah, absolutely. But he had always kind of been tired of, I mean, I was afraid of the dark. I did like to make sure all the doors were locked when I went to sleep. You know, I like to leave a nightlight on or something, if at all possible. I did, you know, just have that. You know, I can understand how that might be frustrating, you know, to live with day in and day out. But, you know, he also knew me and he knew that I wasn't the type of person that just made things up or saw a deer and thought I saw a monster. You know, I mean, we'd been out in the country. We lived somewhat out in the country. We saw lots of wildlife. He knew that I could identify pretty much any wildlife I saw. I remember one night in the middle of the night, we heard this ungodly screaming, sounded like a woman, and he flies out of bed, terrified, goes for the you know window, and I'm just sleepy, and I roll over, and I'm like, it's a lynx, go back to bed. I'm very familiar with the animals in that area, what they look like, you know, and the noises they make. It was definitely very insulting when he refused to even entertain the prospect that what I said I had saw was what I saw. Yeah, it didn't help the marriage. But I think that as with most marriages that go out, everyone's much happier when it's all said and done. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness you are. And I said it once and I'll say it again. Shame on him for responding that way. Well, I also think that a lot of times people respond like that out of their own fear. You know, as I'm telling him there's a werewolf, I see his face go white and I see his eyes go wide and I see fear in his face. So, I mean, it hurts when someone, you know, after the fact in your home and you try to talk about it, they still refuse to hear what you're saying and even resort to being like, well, you know, I'm sure you thought, you know, what you saw, but, you know, maybe your brain just made this up. You know, maybe you couldn't help it. Maybe it was a hallucination. I'm like, I'm healthy. I'm 23 years old. (laughs) You know, why would I be hallucinating? I've never hallucinated before. A lot of times I think that when people react like that, it's because they're afraid themselves and they just 
don't want to entertain the prospect that whatever you're saying is out there is out there. Well, yes, and I can understand how that might have frightened him, but he's your husband. He's supposed to support you. He's supposed to be there for you. You obviously were traumatized whether you actually had that experience or not. You definitely believed that you did, so he should have supported you. Like I said several times before, shame on him for responding that way. That's horrible. Yeah, that relationship had a lot of problems, you know, and that was definitely one of them in the end. Yeah, I can understand why it was. When the dogman was rising to his full height, did he look unsteady or perfectly balanced? Perfectly balanced. There was no wobble whatsoever. He looked like a linebacker. He looked like I could have faced my car toward him and hit the gas and he could have caught it. It wasn't like, you know, a dog that's balancing on its feet for treats or what have you. I mean, he was slow and deliberate. He kept his eyes locked to mine. After you had told me that they like to scare you, it made perfect sense because as he stood, he kind of kept his head low enough so that he could keep eye contact with me. I could tell, you know, because he was a few feet away from the car that he had risen to a height higher than my car. I could also tell that he had a lot more to go as I couldn't even like see the tops of his legs yet. But he kept that eye contact and he was just steady as could be. So then I'm clear on this. He said he was eight feet tall, even though he hadn't risen to his full height yet. Sorry, that's probably confusing. What I meant was that at his full height, I would have guessed him to be around eight feet tall. I'm really bad with measurements. I know that hunched, he was probably six, seven feet. He was a few feet away from me. He managed to keep his eye contact with me as he stood. And I still couldn't see his legs yet. I don't know how long the legs were. I got the sense that he was more torso than leg length. I could be wrong on that. My guesstimate is if I would have allowed him to reach full height, he would have stood around eight feet. I could be wrong about that. Like I said, measurements, so not my strong suit. Oh, that's all right. I totally understand. I mean, look at everything you're trying to hold together when all this was going on. You're just doing good to know your own name. So no harm, no foul on that. How much faith did you have in your car to protect you from it if it decided to attack you? It's funny you ask that. I had a Dodge Intrepid at the time, and it was one of the older models. So it was like driving a tank. I hit brick walls with my car, <laughs> and it didn't even you know, leave a scratch. Like I had complete faith all the time in that car that I would be protected until then. I got the sense that if he wanted me, he could have taken that car apart like he was just opening a can of sardines. It would have been nothing. Some of it could have been the fear. It's hard to say. But looking at him with that power, and he had this presence, this intelligence to him. It wasn't like you see a wolf and you're impressed because it's large, you know, and you think, wow, what a powerful animal. With his size and his presence, I realized that there was not a car, not a house, not a building, not a basement that could keep him out. If he wanted me, he could have taken me. With those muscles, even with my pedal to the metal going as fast as I could in that car, he could have caught me if he wanted to. I had never seen anything like it. I have still to this day never seen anything so powerful. And I have such a hard, I have a hard time describing it because I don't know that there's enough reference, you know, that we have to get across like how powerful these things are. It's good you understand that, the fact that he could have gotten you if you wanted to. Like you said, he could have ripped right into your car. Again, if that's what he wanted to do, but he didn't. How long did you stay in your home there in Isabella County before you moved after having that encounter? Not very long. At the time, we were living right on the Isabella Clare County line. We were staying actually in the home that I had grown up in. My great grandmother had passed away. So my mother had taken her house over and we had moved into the mobile home there. We were there a couple of months until we had enough money saved up to move. And, you know, all of our family was in the area. So we didn't go far. 
it didn't help any being a few miles away with the size of, you know, predators, generally their territory ranges outward. You know, the bigger a predator is, the larger its territory will be. With a predator that size, I couldn't even begin to imagine how far away I would have to get in order to not see one or to not be in his territory. But we didn't stay there long. We unfortunately didn't move far, though. And then the marriage kind of crumbled. After the marriage crumbled, I ended up moving back in with my parents. I just I just couldn't take being alone. By then, I had three little girls. I felt vulnerable. I felt like I had no witnesses, really, and no way to protect you know, these little girls. And I just felt unsafe. And I ended up moving back with my parents. Not too long after that, I ended up meeting my current husband. And, you know, then we moved to upstate New York. Sounds like you're much better off now. Thank goodness for that. I'm just glad the fear was gone. You know, I don't know what it is with that area. And it's not just relegated to that area. You know, I lived several different places. I lived in Macosta County, you know, I lived in Isabella County, Clare County, in central Michigan. Everyone else seemed to be fine, but I just always had that pervasive, creeping fear, even in like broad daylight. And it was really just kind of like a miracle moving to a different state. And it was like, it's gone. Like it's just a breath of fresh air. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad to hear that it's so much easier for you to deal with now. Thank goodness for that. How sure are you or aren't you that it wouldn't have attacked you if you wouldn't have been in your car that night? You know, I think it would have been much more terrifying. I mean, it's hard to think more terrifying as it froze my blood. And you know how when you have like that adrenaline surge when you're afraid and it almost hurts? It was definitely one of those moments. But I don't think it would have made one bit of difference. I think that he could have taken that car apart like nothing. I have to tell myself that since he could have taken that car apart like nothing, that car meant nothing. So I think that the outcome probably would have been the same, although I would have run away much more slowly. (laughs) Oh, sure. And for good reason. What kinds of changes did you make to how you did things after you had that encounter? And how much faith did you have in those changes to protect you? I had always been a fearful person. So I had always been, you know, have a light on, make sure all my doors are locked. I was always very safety conscious that I was trying to keep whatever might be out there, out there. So I really didn't have to make too many changes. I double checked, of course, to make sure that, you know, my windows and everything were closed. I would say that I stayed away from the woods more. I used to go mushroom hunting and stuff like that. And we used to go camping occasionally, even though I wasn't a big fan of the camping. I never liked being out in the woods after dark. I liked it during the day. But, you know, as the middle of the night comes and you're in a tent, and to me, that always just felt creepy. You know, unless you had like a huge party of friends or something out there, then that was a bit different. Not like it would make any difference to dog man. I would say that I didn't, you know, wander out in the woods during the day by myself to look for mushrooms or, you know, I used to take my daughter, my eldest daughter was three at the time. You know, we'd go out into the little woods, like behind my parents' house, you know, and we'd look for mushrooms and stuff during the day. She still loved to do that. So we would do that, but we would stay within sight of the house. You know, we never ranged anywhere further out like we used to do. So I would say that, you know, my routine of making sure that everything was locked, everything was safe was pretty much the same. I did definitely stop putting myself in situations where I was out in the wilderness by myself. I had a horse at the time and I definitely changed my riding patterns. You know, I'd stay closer to the barn. You know, we wouldn't go out in the fields or too far down the dirt roads. You know, and I think about it now and I'm like, what was I even really thinking? He wasn't in the woods when I saw him. He was at the end of someone's driveway, you know, and I lived old. Exactly. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was less than a mile from town. You know, it's not like he was way out in the middle of nowhere, but for some reason in my mind, I had been like, oh, well, he must have come from the woods. Although, like I said, he was pristine. So I have no idea why I would have thought that anyways. At this point, you still couldn't get me to go camping, but that's more for what else could be out there than the dog man. 
it's obvious how much you used to love doing that. So I hope someday down the road, you actually can start doing that again, but time will tell. Do you see having that encounter as a curse or do you wear that as a badge of honor now? For a long time, I thought it was a curse because it was something that I didn't talk about for fear of people reacting like my husband had at the time. That knowledge for a long time felt like a curse. As I've gotten older, though, you know, I think it was a blessing. I have always had a curiosity for what could be out there. We saw a ghost once, so that was weird. I'm one of those people who skeptically wants to believe. I think that things are interesting. I want to know what's going on in the world. I do believe that there's more to everything than we see. So at this point, I would definitely say it was a blessing. I know Dogman exists. And if he exists, what else is out there? Even just, I guess, having confirmation that this thing is real. I saw this thing. Makes me feel a little more validated for being curious. A positive outlook sure works wonders, and you definitely have one. That's great. They say time heals all wounds. Has it totally healed the ones you suffered almost 20 years ago? You know, I know I've told you this before, but I truly and sincerely mean it. I had known the whole time that if he wanted to hurt me, he could have hurt me. But it was really talking to you, Vic, that cemented that in my mind, that this is a blessing. I'm a curious person. I like to read about these things and wonder what's out in the world. And this is a blessing. You know, if he wanted to hurt me, he would have hurt me. Dogman exists, but they're not looking to hurt us. Just know after I spoke to you, you know, and I know that you have spoke to so many people who have had encounters like myself. And for the vast majority of it, they're just looking to scare us. And when you said that, I realized that's exactly what he was doing. He was intelligent. He knew exactly how to display himself and to present himself to get maximum fear out of me. It was really talking to you that, you know, cemented that thought in my mind that, you know, this is a blessing. I know a little more of the world and this isn't necessarily a bad thing. So I very much appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I can't tell you how happy it makes me to hear that. That's great. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Jill. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, I guess all I have to say is if you ever speak to someone who says that they've seen a werewolf, (laughs) just, you know, hear what they have to say without judging. There are things in this world that we don't understand, that we will never understand. And Dogman, I think, is probably unfortunately going to remain one of them but i do know that there are dogmen and there are thousands of people like me who know that there are dogmen so have an open mind oh i'd say you're right yeah we're never going to fully understand dogmen but having said that i want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us i really appreciate it thank you so much for having me you know you're welcome thanks again so much have a great night